to Music Tech Explained, the visual approach. My name is Edgar Rothermich, author of the best-selling book series Graphically Enhanced Manuals. In this video, I will show the hidden and hopefully useful mouse click actions in Logic Pro 10. Be careful, there are many variables. There are different devices with different buttons and configurations, different Logic and OS versions. So if your mouse click outcome is different, feel free to post that in the comments field below. And don't forget to subscribe. Okay, lots of detailed information in this video, so let's get right to it. Mouse click actions might sound simple and easy, because everybody knows how to use a computer mouse. You move its pointer to a specific area and click. Simple as that. Or maybe not. Not only are there so many different types of such devices, like a traditional computer mouse, a trackball or trackpad, the area where it could get confusing is the actual click. Why? Because there are many different types of clicks. Left click, right click, long click, force click, double click and even triple click. And in addition, pressing down various modifier keys on your keyboard while clicking. If you are not aware of those little details, then confusion and ultimately frustration can spoil your computer experience. In our case, the Logic Pro 10 experience. So before I introduce the various secret click actions in this video, I will first provide a little introduction to the various types of clicks and especially their terminology. So please don't skip over the next important section. First, a little history. Apple was the driving force in establishing a mouse as an input device on computers. PCs, on the other hand, relied mainly on the keyboard. Later, Windows PCs used a mouse that had two buttons, the left button and the right button. This established the two terms left click and right click. The mouse on an Apple computer, however, had only a single button. Therefore, there was no left click and right click, only a click. If you used a software application that required a right click action, you had to hold down the control key on your keyboard while clicking. That's where the important control click came from. Apple's substitute for the right click. Here's the first warning. Although the control click is considered the same as the right click on a two button mouse, in Logic Pro 10, this is not necessarily the case. I will show that important distinction in Logic later on in this video. It took Apple a long time with a long history of one-button mice, before they produced a mouse that had two buttons. Funny thing is that Apple's two-button mice still didn't have two buttons. Their design team got rid of the buttons altogether and produced a mouse with a single surface with no visual indication of any button. You can click on the left side or right side of the surface to produce a left click or right click. But remember, in Logic, the right click is not always the same as the control click. There are two terms that Apple uses in this context. The primary button for the left click button and the secondary button for the right click button. Here's a screenshot of the system preferences where you can configure those buttons. The next click action that is very important in Logic is the long click or click hold. Instead of quickly clicking on the mouse button, you press the button down for at least a second or keep on holding it. Logic makes great use of that long click especially for some actions that it wants to hide from the casual logic user. Don't worry, I will show you those hidden actions in a minute. There is one small little detail about clicking on a pop-up menu. When you click with a short click, the menu will open and will stay open until you click on one of the menu selections. If you changed your mind and don't want to select anything, then you can close the menu by clicking outside or press the escape key. You can also open a menu with a long click. However, the outcome is slightly different. When you click hold on the selector, the menu also pops up, but it doesn't require a second click to close it. The menu automatically closes when you release the mouse. If you dragged over a specific menu item while still pressing down the mouse button and now release the mouse button, 
then this will trigger that menu selection. To avoid any action, just drag outside the menu before you release the mouse or press the escape key. The next click action is the force click that was introduced in macOS with the release of the force touch trackpad in Macbox and the separate Magic Trackpad version 2. Here we enter advanced territory and Logic is using this action too, however with a bit of a confusing implementation. The topic of force click would be a video all by itself, so here's just a quick overview. Step 1. The Mac operating system had a little known feature called lookup. You place the blinking cursor at a word in a text document or on a web page and when you press Ctrl Command D, a pop-over window appears displaying the dictionary entry for that word. Later that feature was enhanced with a data detection functionality. Step 2. When trackpads became more sophisticated using gestures and multi-touch, that lookup and data detection feature could be triggered with a three-finger tap on the trackpad. On the left is a screenshot of the system preferences for the trackpad if you have an old MacBook or a first-generation Magic trackpad, where you can enable this three-finger tap lookup gesture. Step 3. In 2014, Apple introduced Force Touch, a term that also shows up in the logic preferences. So you might pay attention to the following information to understand what that setting is doing in logic and why it is misleading. The term Force Touch or 3D Touch describes the ability in trackpads and touchscreens to detect not only when the screen is touched, but it can distinguish between different levels of force that you apply to the surface. Force click is another term used for this force touch gesture, where you press the trackpad and instead of letting go, you press down harder. The funny thing is that with force touch trackpads, there is no physical part that you press down like on a mouse button or early trackpads. You only apply pressure to the surface and magnets underneath vibrate to give you the sensation of a click and a mini speaker produces the acoustic sound of a click that you can enable or disable in the system preferences. By the way, Logic Pro 10 supports these vibrating sensations on a trackpad called haptic feedback for various actions, for example, slightly vibrating when you align regions or move the volume fader across the 0 dB unity gain position. Step 4. Here is the rather confusing part of force touch and the implementation in logic. The general editing preferences in logic has a parameter for the trackpad with a checkbox labeled Enable Force Touch Trackpad. Here is what you have to know about that. This setting has nothing to do with the force touch trackpad. Instead, the setting refers to the three-finger tap that you can use in Logic for various actions like creating regions, creating markers, add or delete note events in the Piano Roll Editor. For this to work, you have to enable the lookup checkbox in the System Preferences for the trackpad. The force click checkbox is not required. That means this Logic feature works on both force touch trackpads and older non-force touch trackpads. However, if force click is enabled in the system preferences, then the lookup checkbox has two options and you have to set it to three finger tap. Here it gets even more confusing. If you use a force touch trackpad on your computer, then the logic checkbox will be active and you have to enable the checkbox. However, if you use a non-force touch trackpad, then that checkbox is grayed out, but the three-finger tap functionality is still working in logic, as long as lookup is enabled in the system preferences. It is quite a nonsensical configuration mess, and on top of it, there seems to be a bug in logic 10.5 compared to 10.4.8 when you use the feature to create a new region. Ok, moving on. Besides the confusion on how you click on a button, the question is also how often you click on it. Typically click actions involve a single click and a double click. 
However, there is also the triple click that you should keep in mind. In case you don't know, it is actually quite common in applications that display text, like a word processor or even web browsers. One click puts the blinking cursor between two characters, a double click selects the entire word, and a triple click selects an entire paragraph. Logic uses a triple click on the automation lane, as we will see later. Modifier keys. Don't forget the modifier keys on your keyboard. This is a standard procedure where you press down a combination of modifier keys during click actions to change its outcome. For example, the shift, the control, the option or the command key. Two things to pay attention to when using modifier keys in logic. First, modifier keys are usually used with a left click. However, did you know that Logic uses a modifier key also with a right click? After watching this video, you will know where and how. Also, the other important consideration about modifier keys is the actual sequence, especially with the click, hold and track procedure. For example, do you hold down the keys first and then click, hold? Or do you click, hold first and then press the modifier key? There are quite a few examples in Logic where users think a specific action doesn't work because they press and click in the wrong order. And last but not least, the click zones or hotspots. This is a technique used in most content creation applications. It means that the click action changes depending on where on the screen you move the mouse cursor over. There is usually a visual indication when the cursor icon, what is referred to as the tool, changes its appearance to let you know what will happen when you click or drag on that area. In addition to the many default click zones in Logic, the general editing preferences has three checkboxes that let you enable or disable specific click zones. Okay, that's it about the little introduction about the mouse clicks. Here's a diagram with a summary that shows what you have to be aware of when clicking around in Logic. Do you use a short click, a long click or a force click? Do you use a single click, a double click or a triple click? Do you use a right button click or a control click instead? Do you use modifier keys, press before or after the click? And what click zones are you positioned at the moment? So, enough teasing and preparation. Now let's reveal those logic click secrets. So before you use the force click action, you have to check two preferences. The first one is the system preferences up here. You go to trackpad and you have to make sure that lookup and data detectors is enabled. But not only that, you also have to make sure that tap with three fingers is enabled. So here's a little trick because that section down here, you only can see if you use actually a force touch trackpad or version two uh, magic trackpad. If that is available, then you have two options up here, force click with one finger or with three fingers. If you have an older trackpad, then you don't see these two options and you have only automatically tap with three fingers selected. So make sure that that lookup is enabled. Then the second preference is in logic. You have to go to general editing and you have to make sure that this trackpad enable force touch trackpad is checked. And as I mentioned in the introduction, enable force touch is misleading because it also works on non force touch trackpads. So the first object that we can create with force click are regions. And this is where we encounter a bug right away. Uh, I use at the moment logic 10.4.8 and this is how it should work. So I use the three finger tap and wherever I point and tap on it, I create a new region. So these are MIDI regions because these are MIDI tracks. If I use that on an audio track down here, it will not create the region. What it does is it opens the import dialog. Import any audio file onto the audio track. So as I said, so this is how it should happen. But 
If I open the same project in Logic Pro 10.5, let me close that and 10.5.1 and I do the same thing. So I select that track and let's put the playhead over here. So now if I click anywhere on the workspace, it does not create the media region where I clicked, it creates the media region on the selected track at the position of the playhead. Again, so if I put the playhead somewhere else and select a different region, and it creates it there no matter where I click. So this obviously is a bug. Okay, so this was adding an object, the media region or audio region, where you click with a three finger tap. The next force click action is to use it to create a marker. And for the marker, you have to remember, a little recap, markers are part of the global track, so you can make the global tracks visible by clicking this button or using the key command G but then you have all the other global tracks that you might not need because if you need only the marker, then there is a nifty little shortcut, a key command, you press the apostrophe key. And that is used if you want to show only the marker track. So very quick to toggle that around. So if you have the marker track visible, same thing, you use the click action three finger tap and you can create quickly markers without holding any modifier keys. But even, let me undo that, even if the marker track is not visible and only the ruler, so you can still click on the ruler area here and it still can create a new marker on that ruler. So if we make that visible on the marker track, so you have both option on the marker track or on the playhead ruler up there. Uh, the next one is, let me undo that, is to add MIDI events. Here's a MIDI region. If I make that visible in the piano roll adder, same thing here. I use the force click action by tapping with three fingers. Wherever I click, it will create a new MIDI event. Let me open that up. On that exact position where I click. The same thing if I click again on a MIDI event, then that will be deleted. So I can click on an empty space to create a MIDI event and I click on a MIDI event to delete that. Again, no additional modifier keys needed for that. And the same thing also works in the score editor. So you have a couple of notes here. If I force click an existing MIDI event on a note, it will be deleted. And I can click anywhere to create a new MIDI event right there in the score editor. Adding MIDI events is a little bit tricky because then it's get a little bit messed up. So it's more useful if you use it for deleting MIDI events. So it's a limited use for actually creating because the position where you click, you have to be a little bit more precise and then you might be lucky to get the right result that you want. The next object that you can create is automation. If you have a region selected and you want to create automation points on the borders on the left and right of that region, you don't have to switch anything. You don't have to hold any modifier keys. The only thing what you do, you force click right there. And here are your automation points on the left and on the right. The only problem is with single automation point, if I drag that down, then it will affect any automation, any kind of event before or after that. Like for example, if you want to have here constant volume, that will not happen because by dragging this down, you will create like a decreasing volume down here. Therefore, a better solution is to create not one automation point on each border. You want to have two 
automation. So you hold down the shift and control key and you can see already here what you will get is the automation curve tool. That is the one here. That's the one. So you don't have to switch to that tool. It will automatically switch to that too. It will automatically switch to that tool when you hold down the shift control. And now when you do the force click, it looks like that you also create only one automation point. But if you zoom in close enough, you can see it actually creates two automation points, a frame or two frame apart. And the result of that is if I lower that automation curve, you can see only that one will be dragged down and it will not affect anything before or after that click. So that's very helpful for this kind of action. So again, force clicking once creates only one automation point on each side and shift control force click will create two automation point. So you have a hinge on both sides. So that's all for the force click action. Here's an example where the long click and the regular click is used in the channel strip. Let's look at this little button here, the channel mode button that is available on the input slot on all the channel strips, the audio input channel strips. If you click on it, it toggles between mono with a single circle and stereo, that double circle. So just toggle mono stereo. However, the channel mode has three other modes, but you only can access them if you long click. If you long click then or click hold, a pop-up window opens where you have the mono and the stereo, the default modes, but you also have left, right and surround. If you select surround, then you get the channel strip in surround mode 5.1 input and the surround panel. Then if you select, oh yeah, and one thing, the weird thing is if you toggle the channel mode button in surround mode, it will switch back to stereo and then stereo mono, it go, doesn't go back to surround sound anymore, but the surround panel stays there. So that's one of the really, yeah, not so perfect implementation of the surround mode in Logic Pro 10, which I don't get into at that moment. The other two modes, so I'm long click on this channel mode button again, and here is the left and right. And if you look closely, you have two circles next to each other. The one is filled on the left side. If you click, now it toggles from the left to right, left, right, left, right, which is the same then selecting left, right from that pop-up menu. But what does it mean? So let's set it to left and I'm importing a stereo file. And listen to that one. In this extreme stereo, you have guitar on the left channel and drums on the right channel of this interleaved stereo audio file. This is just an example because it could be like a um, dialogue on one or two different languages. So it's just like a split stereo in, an, uh, in a stereo file, um, in an interleaved stereo file. What you can do in Logic, which is very clever, so you have that stereo clip stereo audio file on the audio track and it plays back in stereo. Now, if I select left, put the channel mode in left, and I play back that audio clip. So you have the only one channel playing in mono. If you click right, you have the other track playing back in mono. That means you can place a stereo interleaved file on the audio track, but then only pick left or the right and that signal, the left channel or the right channel of that stereo audio file will then be played back on that channel strip. So if you want to have both channels, the left and the right separate, so the only thing what you need to do is you place the same, you make a copy on two separate tracks and one you 
select left and one you select right. And now we have separate control over the left channel and the right channel. So you don't have to split the stereo audio file into mono files like usually the way you do it in Pro Tools. Here in Logic you just operate with the same audio clip and just pick the left or the right and put it on an audio track and process it separately. So that's so far for the channel mode button. Long click to access that and single click you just toggle between mono stereo or left right. Here is a handy click action if you have an audio interface with multiple inputs and outputs. For example, if you hook up your DIW to an external mixer. So in Logic you can select multiple channel strips and they act as a group. So whatever adjustment you make, so that will apply to the entire group of selected channel strips. Doesn't matter any kind of controls or you can even set select bus send and that will apply to the whole group and they don't even have to be adjacent. They can be anywhere. So if you apply, let's say, um, any kind of plugin and that plugin will be applied to all the sele currently selected tracks. So that also works for the input and output assignment. For example, if you have a couple of tracks and you want to all assign them to a specific output, for example, output three, and boom, they all be set to output three. Or you want to have all the outputs assigned to stereo out and in one go, you have them all assigned to stereo. Or you go back to mono output one. However, if you have a multi-channel audio interface, as I said before, hooked up to a mixer, then what you want is have the individual channel strip of your mixer assigned to the inputs of your channel strips in Logic 1, 2, for example, 116. And if you mix outside the box, so let's say you have a DIW, you have a project that you want to mix on an external mixer, then you want to set the outputs not to all to stereo out and mixing in the box. Instead, you want to have individual outputs which then are routed to the external mixing console. In order to do that, you do the same thing. Select all the channel strips that you want to assign to sequential order of the input and output, input or output. And the only thing you do now is to hold option key down. So and now I'm holding down the option key, channel one to 16, all the audio tracks are selected. And now if I select the first input, click on that one and look what happens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to 16. So with one click, I assign sequential order to all the selected tracks instead of each of the 16 track do the assignment individually. The same thing applies for the output. So all the outputs are set to, to output one. I hold down now my option key, select the output mono one, and it assigns everything one, two, three, four in sequential orders of all the tracks one to 16 in one go. And the same thing applies if you want to have only a couple of tracks. Uh, let's put them all back without option key. And let's say I want to have only these six to 11 or even include that one. You can hold down the option key and then make the assignment mono. And for example, let's say op output four because now it selects the output four, five, six and so on. So it starts a sequential order from whatever output you select. So I'm doing that right now, output four and you can see four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That one was not selected, so they stay. And then after nine comes 10. Very handy. The next click action you might already know that is the one to show legacy plugins.
So we go to the slot, for example, for the audio effects plugins. So you click on it and you see all the different plugins, or you go to the instrument slot and you see all the instrument, software instrument plugins. Now, instead of just clicking that slot, you hold down the option key, which I'm doing right now, click on the audio effects and you see one additional um, menu item that opens a submenu and that is the legacy option. So that means here are all the plugins or the legacy plugins that are not shown as default in Logic. For example, if you want to have the platinum verb or the silver compressor, silver gate, all the old plugins, so you still have access to that. Unfortunately, it does not work for the EXS24. So if I hold down the option key, click on the instrument slot, I have the legacy plugin. So you have all the, most of them are GarageBand uh, plugins, which are kind of the other plugins with a reduced user interface, but you won't see the legacy EXS24 because with uh, Logic 10.5, we get the new sampler plugin and that replaced the EXS24 with a hard cut. So you don't have access to EXS24 anymore. Um, so that was the legacy plugin access. The next one is group plugins sorted by channel format. So or you group the plugins. What I mean with that is, let's look again, audio effects plugins. So these are the audio effects plugins. And then you have the specific format that is available. For example, if it's a stereo channel strip, then you have a stereo format and dual mono. And if you have, for example, let's switch that to surround, then some of the plugins either in multi output or most of them. And if I select, yeah, some of them will show up as 5.1, for example, here 5.1. So you have the typically gain plugin, but look at that. So that is the multi 5.1 gain plugin for the, so you have the master left, center, right, left, surround, right, surround. So that's the surround plugin. However, if you hold down the shift key and select the plugin, the, the, the plugin slot, what I'm doing right now is shift. And sometimes you have to click twice, then all of a sudden the plugin menu looks like that. So it is grouped not by individual plugins, but it groups by channel format. So that means now you have all the mono plugins, multi mono plugins and all the 5.1 plugins. So you have access to those or the audio units. If you have a mono uh, channel strip like here, again, hold the shift key and click on the audio effects slot twice. <laughs> and again, you have separate groups as mono and mono to stereo. So this way, so you can search for plugins, they are only available for mono, only for stereo, only for 5.1. And this works for the audio effects plugins and also here for the software instrument plugin slot. So I click twice and you can see here the 5.1 mono mono output. So you have all the plugins sorted by that specific channel format. So if you go to 5.1, so you see which of the plugins, for example, the sampler, the sculpture and ES2 are the only ones that are actually available in 5.1 format. Another hidden feature is regarding the channel strip settings. Uh, it is kind of a legacy format because now everything is about patches. So if we go to the library browser, and so usually what you see here are the patches. If you have the setting button, that library focus triangle, if that is pointing to the setting button, then what you see here are the different patches. So if you have channel strip settings that you saved in the past, they will be shown here in the library browser. So you have a combination of patches and channel strip settings. And if you click here on that button, which is the setting button, then you have all the channel strip settings displayed in that pop-up menu. So if you can see here, so one, two, three, and then the subfolder are the same as you can see here. And it is kind of smart in the way to 
display what is actually available because if here this is a software instrument track, it shows the channel strips, channel strip setting of the software instrument channel strip. And if you select an audio track, it shows the channel strip settings of the audio channel strip. So the hidden feature is when you hold down the option key and now click hold on the setting button, you see this. So instead of, in that case, a software instrument channel strip setting, you will see all the other types of channel strips. So the audio channel strip, input channel strip, aux channel strip, and so on. So now you can access the channel strips from the other channel strip types. The same thing if you select an audio channel strip and now go to the setting button and hold down the option key before click holding it. Now you see all the other channel strip types instead of the audio channel strip for the channel strip settings. It might sound a little bit confusing, but if you know about channel strip types and use channel strip settings, so this is something that might be useful because so you can load channel strip settings without the restrictions of specific channel strip types. The next click action many Logic users might know already. Here the EQ thumbnail and the gain reduction component here, that's the one you can make visible in the channel strip settings like here, EQ, thumbnail and gain reduction. They are very handy because not only do they display the gain reduction or the EQ, you can use them in two ways. First of all, if there were no EQ selected, you can just click on it and you can initiate an EQ, channel EQ plugin. The same thing for the gain reduction meter. If you click on that, it will load the compressor plugin. And if you have one of those plugins loaded in either the channel strip or the compressor, then you can click on it to toggle the plugin window. And here's an additional click action. If you hold down the shift key, let's do it here, hold down the shift, and I click on an empty EQ thumbnail, then instead of the channel EQ, it loads the linear phase EQ. Two other quick click actions are here in the for the solo button. Usually in Logic, the solo button is a latch mode button. That means if you click on it, it latches. It's and then you have to click again to disable it. It's like you engage a button and you disengage and go in and out. And the other mode is called exclusive mode that is also available. That one you hold down the option key and click on a solo button and then selecting any solo button will disable any other solo button that I had before. And the same thing also works for the mute button. So mute is also in latch mode. So you engage or disengage the button. But if you hold down the option key, you have mute exclusive. So clicking on one mute button disables the other mute button. And last but not least, that's the one everybody should know in Logic. That's a very old trick you can do. For example, if you have to mute a whole selection of channel strips, you just drag across and have them all muted or drag across again. And you have all these adjacent channel strips unmuted. Same thing with the solo. And it even works here with the record enable mode and with the input monitoring. And almost forgot the very last one. Let's go back to the mixer window. For example, if you assign groups, so here for the channel strip, I assign it to group one and I want to have other channel strips also assigned to that group one. So you can also click on the group slot and go back to go down to group and select that to group. A uh, faster way is if you just hold down the option key and click on the group slot. For example, here I hold down the option key. I want that to be group one, that group one, that one, and that one. And so if I group that to assign that to group two, now the same thing applies here. 
Group 2 was the last one I assigned. So now when I use the option click on the group slot, then the last one, which was group 2, will be assigned to those I option click on it. Super fast, super handy, keep it in your workflow. The outcome of any click action that you perform with the mouse depends on what tool you have selected for the mouse cursor. So the tool is the most important part. Logic has a very elaborate system how to switch between different tools and something might be confusing and some stuff might be even unknown. So I try to walk through that in six steps to explain that concept and the implementation in Logic. Step number one, the standard operation. The main window in Logic has these two selectors up here. That's where you select the tool. So you have the tool menu on the left and you have another tool menu that opens here on the right. So two selectors. The difference is that one is the selection for the left click tool. And the second selector opens a menu where you can pre-select a tool when you press down the command key. So that's standard procedure. Everybody know that. So for example, here we have the uh, pointer tool. So wherever you move around, you have the pointer so you can select different regions. If you hold down the command key, that tool will be switched to, which is in that case, the marquee tool. So you can switch to anything. For example, if you go to mute tool, that means I still have the selector and if I hold down the command key, it switches to the mute tool so I can quickly mute a region. And keep in mind that these two selectors are available in any window that has a timeline. For example, here in the piano roll editor or the audio track editor. And you can select different tools. And you see first one, command tool is the mute button. Let's switch it to marquee again. But here in the audio track editor, you have the flex tool. So you can select different pre-selected tool when you switch to the different editors. And the other thing in the standard operation uh, is the contextual menu. Standard procedure, you right click anywhere and you open the contextual menu. Logic calls a shortcut menu, but I prefer contextual menu because it's more descriptive. Shortcut could mean anything, but contextual menu means that menu that opens is in the context of where you click. For example, if you click on an audio region, it's a different selection of tools that if you click on the drama region, for example, or just somewhere in the background, the menu is different. So it depends on the context. Therefore, contextual menu and not shortcut menu. And to open the contextual menu, either right click or you use the left click by holding down the control key. Okay, then step number two, the right click tool. So remember, we have two selectors, left click, command click. If you go to the preferences, general editing, right mouse button, that's where the confusion starts. Because the right mouse button assigns the action what happens if you click with the right mouse button. The default is opens shortcut menu or contextual menu. That's what I just demonstrated. If you click with the right mouse button, the contextual menu opens. And here you have four options. If I click, if I select the first one, is assignable to a tool. Pay attention what happens here to the two selectors. I select is assignable to tool and voila, we have not one, two, now we have three tool selectors. So let's operate that for the moment and see what that means. You see left click tool, command click tool, and this one is called the right click tool menu. So that means you can select a different tool and that one will only be active if I press down the right mouse button. So if I do that here, right click, I use the action mute that region because here that's the mute button is there. And if I select erase, if I right click, it erases that. So you have the option to quickly switch between three pre-selected tools by using the left click, 
by using the left command click or using the right click. And for the contextual menu, that means now if you right click, it won't open the contextual menu as usual. So in that case, if you want to open the contextual menu, you have to use the control left click. So you still have access to the contextual menu. Okay, so step number three. We have one, two, three tools. And what happens if I click the key command T? Voila, we have another tool menu. So does it mean we have four tool menus? One, two, three, one, two, three, and then key command T. That is the other confusion with that tool menu because that one is not a fourth tool menu. This is kind of a remote tool menu of that left click tool menu up here. For example, if I change to text tool, command T, you see that is selected. I change to mute tool, and you see it changes right away to that specific tool. So if you use the key command to, uh, T, this is not a fourth menu, a fourth tool menu. It is a remote menu for that left click tool menu that you have here already. The convenient part is that you don't, if you have your mouse down here, you don't have to travel up there and click on it. You just use the command T and it opens right there. So it's just a quick convenient. Okay, so, so far for the floating tool menu. Logic calls it tools menu. For example, if you go to the key commands and I press T, that is the key command, show tool menu, key command T. That is kind of confusing because what tool menu is it referring to? Because we have three already. So this should be named show floating tool menu to make it specific that it is that special tool menu that's floating around when you use that key command. So keep in mind, show tool menu refers to show floating tool menu. Okay, so step number four. How do we open the floating tool menu? First thing we saw already, we can use the key command T. The second one is we can use the control right click. Remember in the introduction, I said that the modifier keys are usually used for the left click, but here's an example where the modifier keys are used for the right click. Remember the right click right now is assigned to the mute button, uh, to the mute tool. And now if I hold down the control key and press the right mouse button, it will open that floating tool menu too. So in addition to the two commands to open the floating tool menu, the command T and the control right click, there's a third option. When we go back to the preferences, general preferences, editing, and go to that right mouse button, there is an option opens tool menu. Again, very misleading because what tool menu is it referring to? It means the floating tool menu. So if I select that option opens tool menu, that means now the right mouse button click will open the floating tool menu. Let's try that. So I click the right mouse button and here's the floating tool menu. That means we have three options now to open that floating tool menu. Key command T, hold down control key and right click, or use only the right click. Okay, now step number five. Let's look closer at the floating tool menu because there's something special if you haven't noticed. And that is not only that it lists all the different tools that are selectable the same way like you can do up here in the menu. You notice it doesn't have the letters, but here it has letters. So that means you have additional key commands. And this is the important part. These are key commands. They act as a second layer or a higher priority compared to the actual key commands. The way it works, so let's open that. Here, the pencil tool, we can select that just from the menu and it switches to the pencil tool. Or we can open the tool menu and I press, 
Hold on a second. Open the tool menu and I press the key command P. And you see it has the same effect. If I press the key when the floating window is not open, then it opens the piano roll editor. So whatever key command is, whatever key is assigned to a specific tool can be used in order to switch to that. For example, we have the M for mute tool. So how it works is I press T, it opens the menu, I press M, it selects the mute tool and automatically closes the window. And if you go to the key commands window and type in tool, then you will see here, these are the actual commands. So the tools menu, that is the floating tool menu. And you can reassign any of these letters to switch to a specific left click tool. So that is really powerful. And little trick, the reason why the pointer tool is assigned to T is very convenient. For example, if you select P, so you have the pencil tool. So you can add new regions. But if you want to go back to the pointer tool, you would press T to open the floating menu. And you would press T again to switch to the pointer tool. But you can do the same thing in one go. Go back. So now we have the pencil tool. And we just press T twice very fast. One, two. Because what you did is you opened the floating tool menu and pressed T to select the tool. So that's very convenient to have it assigned the same key that opens the floating tool menu and switches back to that pointer tool. And here, step number six, a little secret that a lot of logic users don't know. If I go to open the floating tool menu, I see pencil tool is assigned to P. Now, if I click the key P, it will close the floating tool menu. But what I'm doing right now, instead, I'm pressing the P, but I'm holding it. So I press P, I keep pressing the key down. I make my first adding new region, second adding new region, third adding new region. Now I'm done with the pencil tool and I want to go back to the pointer tool. Remember, I'm still pressing down the P key. What I'm doing now is I'm releasing the P key and now pay attention to this tool. It automatically switches back. So that means whatever keys assigned to you can keep on pressing that key and do the action that you want as long as you hold down that key and when you release the key, then it will switch back to the pointer tool. So let's do that again, this time with the uh, mute tool. So I press T, opens it, I press and hold the M key, I mute, the region that I want and now pay attention to the tool. So it's still M. If I release the M key, it switches back to the pointer tool. You have to try it a couple of times, but it's very quick, especially if you use a couple of things just for the pencil tool or the mute tool, something that you use more often and you get that workflow, you get the hang of that, then you can really dramatically speed up your workflow and get in and out and flip between different tools very quickly. And here's a little overview that shows what happens. So he has a different click actions, the click, control click, the right click and the control right click. Um, the click always triggers the left click tool. The control right click always triggers the floating tool menu. It opens the floating tool menu and the control click always opens the contextual menu. And with the only exception here or with the only addition, with that se uh, option selected, it would also show the contextual menu and the floating tool menu. That is actually, I haven't showed you before. That is, let me quickly show that. That is that option and it is something like that because then you have the typical contextual menu here 
and you have the floating tool menu on top of that together as one combined menu. And keep in mind that the contextual menu part, that will change depending on where you click on. Okay, I forgot about that. So again, so these are different options. And uh, so you have the right mouse button preferences option, four of them. I renamed it a little bit different. I wish they would be renamed that so to make it more clear because what happens is it's assign, assignable to a tool. It's not very clear if it would say right mouse button functions as a right click tool. That means you have the right click tool that is assigned when you right click on that uh, workspace. Opens tool menu should say opens floating tool menu because then the floating tool menu opens here. Open shortcut menu, that is the default. That means it opens the contextual menu as you can see here. And the one I just showed you, the open tool and shortcut menu means opens the floating tool menu plus the contextual menu and that's what's showing here. So that preference setting, right mouse button, that determines what will happen if you right click on the workspace and you have these four options. This section shows the various click actions regarding dragging objects. So we're looking at six different types of objects and what you can see here is especially what I pointed out in the introduction that sometimes it is important the timing. When do you press a modifier key? Before you click or after you click? Uh, another thing that I point out here is the inconsistency in logic. Because with all the click actions, modifier key, key commands, the important part is that there should be some kind of system because it's impossible to remember and memorize thousands of click actions and key commands. If there's any kind of system that you can remember, then it's much easier to apply. For example, if moving them to the left or moving them to the right is the same modifier keys for any of the six objects. Let me demonstrate what I mean by that. Let's start with the MIDI note event. Here's a single MIDI note event. And if you want to drag them around, you can drag the entire MIDI note event, or you can only drag the right or the left border. So you trim the MIDI note event. Um, one important tool that you use is the snap feature. Uh, the snap feature, as you can see here, because then when you drag around, it is limited to a specific snap grid and the snap grid. So you set here in the menu. So right now I have set it to one bar. So that means if I click track that read that MIDI note event, it will snap to a full bar grid. Sometimes you want to have a different grid, so you have to go there and click on it and select a different grid. And sometimes you don't, don't want to snap to grid at all. So you have to go there and turn it on and off. So that's a lot of work. So you don't want to do that. And it would be much easier if you can do that with modifier keys. And that's exactly what happens. So again, I drag the right border and it snaps to one bar. If I hold down the control key, you can see it will disable the snap to grid so I can drag it wherever I want without any restriction. And then if I hold the control and shift key and I drag and see that is what happening. So I still can drag it, but the mouse cursor is disconnected to the actual movement of what it happens here. So what that means is I'm dragging with a much finer resolution. So as you can see here, if I drag any kind of borders, the border that I drag and the actual mouse movement is the same. If I hold down the shift key, then I have to drag much further to the left or to the right, which a much smaller precise result that I'm getting. So that's the final resolution. So I have a total of three different settings. I have the default settings, which is the what I have enabled here in Snap. At the moment, it's one bar. If I hold down the control key, I disable the Snap feature. And if I hold down the control and the shift key and have a final resolution. So very simple. 
So they would be cool if I have the same procedure for all the other objects. So let's look at the region. If I go up here, the same thing. I have a separate setting for the snap, snap to grid, but I also set it to bar. If I move the whole region, you see it snaps to one bar. If I move the borders, trimming the borders, it's also snapping to one bar. If I hold down the control key, I would expect that also snap would be off. But what I'm seeing right now is it is not off. It is still snap to grid, but with a much lower grid. Right now it is a quarter grid, as you can see here. And if I hold down the shift key plus the control key and then the expected final resolution procedure happens here. So let's go back. So that means that's inconsistency. So we have first one with grid, second one holding down the control key. I expect no grid, but there is some grid. And with the shift and control key, then that is the expected behavior. Number three, the final resolution. What that second behavior is, when I hold down the control key, what happens is it will apply a grid based on the division. And the division is some special feature in logic some people might not be familiar with. It's like an additional division, like if you can see here in the... So you have bars, beat, division, text, frames, it goes on. So division is a variable. Division is whatever you set up here in that field, and that is the division value, which you can set from quarter notes all the way to 192 notes, uh, uh, resolution. So right now it is set to quarter. So if I hold down the control key and move, so you will see a grid of quarter notes. If I change the division value to eighth note, hold down the control key, and now you can see it follows a grid restricted to the grid of eighth note. So that means the behavior here is grid, division grid, final resolution. Here we had grid, no grid, final resolution. So already an inconsistent between the two of those. One thing I want to point out here, if I hold down the control key, here's the important part. If I hold down the control key first and then click, track, then I get the contextual menu. That means in that case, if I want to use the control key as a modifier key, the sequence becomes important because I have to hold down, click hold first, then hold down the control key, and then I have the desired behavior. And the same thing is true when do you release the control key. That means you have to release the control key at the end. So the whole sequence is click hold, hold down control key, make your adjustment, then you release the mouse and then you release the control key. Otherwise, what you can see here, because if I release the control key first, then it will jump to the crit based on the snap to crit value. So a lot of small little details you have to wrap your head around to make it exactly happen what you want it to happen. So now let's look at the marquee. So I have the command tool set to the marquee tool. So I hold down the uh, actually, let's do it the other way. Let's select the marquee tool so I don't have to use any modifier key. And what I'm seeing here, same behavior. I drag around and it follows the snap to grid. So far, so good. What happens if I hold down the control key? It will use the same behavior as the region. It will snap to the division. And now if I hold down the shift and control key, you can see it is not a final resolution behavior. And now it is snap to grid off. That means another variation. So who could remember all that stuff? So with the marquee tool, so we have follow the grid, hold down the control key, it will follow the grid 
by division and if you hold shift and control key it will set the snap to grid off. Now let's look at the cycle range. The good news is the cycle range now behaves exactly like the marquee tool. But only if you use the cycle range as moving the whole cycle range as one unit, not the trim. If I move the whole cycle range, it snaps to grid. If I hold down the control key, it uses the division grid. And if I hold down the shift control key, it sets the, sna uh, the snap to grid off. So that's the same behavior as the marquee selection what I had showed before. However, when I use the trim, first thing, it behaves as expected. So we have the snap to grid. But now if I use the control key, it will not snap to division, it will turn snap to grid off. Again, another variation, even the variation inside the same object. So that is even another inconsistency for that. And if you look at the actual marker, it's a similar thing. So if I drag the whole marker, no modifier key, it will drag with a snap to grid. If I hold down the control key, it will snap to division. And if I hold down the shift and control, it will turn snap to grid off. And here's even another variation that nobody can, can remember. If you now drag the borders of a marker, no matter what I'm pressing down, control, control, shift or nothing at all, it will always snap to the division that I have set up here. So another variation for that. And now let's go to the sixth object that is to see what happens with um, automation points. If I drag an automation point up and down to change the value, there's no restriction. But if I hold down the control key, you can see here I have the final resolution on the y-axis. That means I can change the value with a much finer resolution. But again, important, the sequence you have to pay attention to. First press it with the mouse, then hold down the control key, make the adjustment, release the mouse, release the key. If you don't follow the that sequence, if I hold down the control key first and press, you get the contextual menu. And if you release the control key first, then you can see that jumps all over the place. So pay attention. First, click down with the mouse, then hold down the control key, make the adjustment, release the mouse, release the control key. And if you wonder what happens if you drag left and right, for that you have, let's go to the snap menu, you will see automation for the x-axis, so moving left and right, it has its own snap to grid value that you can set independently from the actual snap value. So overall we have six different objects and all the objects have a different behavior regarding when you drag, when you hold down control key drag and when you hold down shift control key and drag. So this is a mess, as I said before, there should be some consistency that dragging any kind of object and the modifier key should have a similar behavior. Snap to grid, snap to grid off and finer resolution or any combination of that. At least you remember only the concept and then don't have to remember each individual object because that concept applies to all those objects. Next, a couple of click actions in the piano roll editor. First one we covered already and that is the force click. So we have the piano roll here. I use the force click, which means tap with three fingers. And here we just can create new MIDI note events. 
The same thing if we force click on existing node events, they will be deleted. The next one we also covered already, that is the snap to grid. So remember we have three, sometimes four variations. Right now I have the snap to grid enabled to snap to bars. So if I click track in MIDI node event, it will snap to a bar grid. If I hold down the control key, it will snap to the division. And if I hold down the shift and control key, then you have the finer resolution. One little inconsistency I pointed out earlier. Remember, if I move with control, it will go to a division grid. But if I use the trim, regular trim by snap to grid, but if I hold the control key, it will go to snap off. That's the inconsistency. So with the trim, you hold down the control key, it is snap off. If you move with control key down, it will snap to division. And remember the sequence. First, hold down the mouse button, then press down the modifier key, make the adjustment, then release the mouse button and then release the modifier key. And the third one is quantization. Here's a little trick with the clicking. Let me turn that off. So if you have a note event here, you have set the quantize value to quarter note. Now, if you quantize that, you can use the quantize tool. So right now you've seen here, I have the command tool set to quantize. That's the quantize tool. That means if I hold down the command key right now, the tool, the cursor tool changes to the quantize tool. So that means if I click now, it will quantize to the next quarter note as here. Let me redo that. So here that's the pointer tool, hold down the control and I can quickly quantize that value. However, if I want to quantize and the quantize value is set to a value that I don't want, for example, if I want to quantize to a whole note, technically I have to go over there, change the from the menu, then it will snap to that grid. But you don't have to do that because there is a thing called the long click. And I'll show you how that works. Hold down the command key because now we get the quantize tool. And now instead of clicking, which would quantize that node value, I click hold. And what it does, what you see here, it will open the quantize menu. That means I can just go in here and select the new quantize value and will automatically quantize to that value and sets the quantize value here in the inspector to that specific value. And the fourth one I want to show you here that comes in really handy. That is how to trim the end or the length of MIDI notes. So right here, if I select a selection of a couple of notes and I trim them, they will trim their ending proportionally. However, I have two options. I can hold down the shift key and you can see I can trim and all the notes, regardless of where they start, will end trim to the same end position. If I hold down the option and shift key, as you can see, it will trim the note length to the same length. So regardless of the different length of the individual note, if I hold the shift and option key, and drag the right edge, it will adjust all three notes to the same note length. And remember, as long as you hold down the mouse button, you can switch between proportionally, same end position, same length. Here is a little click action regarding the track automation and the region automation. Remember, there are two types of automation in Logic. The one called track automation is automation that applies to the entire track. And that's when you have the automation button here set to track. 
but also you can embed automation data inside a region, not only media region, but also audio region. That means the automation data is part of the actual region and it moves along wherever you move that region to. So you can view track automation and region automation by clicking on this automation button. So where you can view and then edit, add the automation to that specific region, region or if you wanna add it to the track automation. You have to remember use either track automation or region automation. Otherwise you get conflicting data and then your fader or whatever control you have will jump around. If you start with either track automation or region automation and want to put it to the other automation part, so you start with track automation and put it into region or from region you want to copy it over or move it over to track automation, there is one hidden click action. Let me show you how that works. So let me get rid of the track automation. So here there's no track automation on the track, but there is region automation in these two regions. If I want to move this region automation over to track automation, you have one simple option you can do. You hold down the option key and click on that track, uh, on that automation button. So I hold down option key, click on that button and the region automation now is moved over to the track automation. If I view the region automation, you can see it's empty because whatever was there before was moved over now to track automation. I can do the same thing the other way around. Now I have track automation and I want to move that to region automation. I hold down the option key, click that button and you get one dialog window tells you that whatever you have in between in the track automation where there is no region that will be deleted. Actually, let me show you what that means. So let's say here's automation data. It goes up, down and then up again, but there is no region in between. So if I move all that track automation over to region automation, so again, option and click on that button, it wants me that that will happen and now pay attention to that automation data here. So if I confirm with OK, so whatever automation data was in between actual regions, that will be lost. And only the automation data that covered existing region that will be moved over from track automation to region automation. If you want to move that back, hold option, click region, all the automation data that were part of the region now is re-established over there. Here's a click action that was introduced in the 10.5 update. And that is where you can toggle between showing interpolation data and hiding the interpolation data. Here is what that means. I'm in region automation and I'm using that region and I create one automation point and a second automation point. So here you have only two automation point. So when I start, the fader will slowly go down depending on that automation curve. However, there are only two points. So that means in between there are actually multiple points that gradually lower that volume. And this is called the interpolated data or the interpolation. So if I open the event editor, you can see the two fader events, the first one and the one down here. However, and you can see two events. If I click the additional info button, what you see here are actually 787 events. So that means in between the first one and the last automation point are 785 other automation points, which gradually lowers the volume from here to there. So that is the standard behavior. But now if I use a new click action, which is shift control option and click on that segment, the following will happen. Now you see only the first one and the second automation point, and there is no interpolated data in between. And you can see it here in the event list, you have only the first and the second fader event, the automation point. 
So you can toggle between interpolated data, no interpolated data. So that means in that case, the automation value 0 dB stays until the next point comes in and then it immediately drops down. So this might be handy sometimes where you use it, especially if you, let me close that down. Let's switch to, if you have any kind of automation curve, and then you can use shift control option and each segment you can switch between gradually polated, interpolated data and none. So we have a step point. So if you have an automation curve, so you also can select the whole curve or a segment of it, use the shift control option and change the whole automation curve from interpolated data to stepped data. Part of the next click action we covered already, and that was about the force click. That means if you have track automation enabled or you have it visible, so you have a region here, now we can use the force click, which means you tap with three fingers inside the automation lane. It automatically creates one automation point on each side of that region. You can also tap with three fingers holding down the shift and control key to create two automation points on the left and right border of the region. You can also use a regular click action to do the same thing to create one automation point on a range that you select. You hold down the shift option and you drag a range and on the left and right border of that range you will have now a single automation point or instead of shift option you hold down shift control option and do the same range selection and now you get two automation points on each side so that means you can drag that segment up and down without affecting the automation data before and after that point and the third one you also can use the the marquee selection so if you are inside that automation view, you track a marquee selection. So right now I have the command tool selected for marquee. So I hold down command, drag a marquee selection. And now if I click inside, instead of making a cut with that marquee selection, I make a click. And what it does, it creates two automation points on the left and the right side of the marquee selection. So very simple. So wherever you want, drag a selection and click inside and boom, there are your two automation points and you can make an adjustment from level or whatever automation control you are choosing there. The next click actions are about selecting and deleting specific automation points or the segments of the automation curve. Right now here we have a specific automation curve, if I double click directly on an automation point, I will delete that automation point. Now, if I hold down the option key and double click, I select that entire automation curve. So the double click with option down, which is the same as clicking here on the trim value automation field. So you can toggle all selected all unselected or you double click on any of the automation point. If you do a single click with option down, then you select only the automation curve from that point on. The ones before they stay unselected. So again, you hold down the option key, a single click will select the automation segment from here on. If you double click with the option down, you select the entire automation curve. And here's an example of the triple click that I mentioned in the introduction. So I hold down the option key and triple click one, two, three, and it opens up a dialog window. Ask you, do you want to delete the automation data? That means here I click yes. So that means I can delete the entire automation data. So instead of doing this on the trim tool, select and then press the delete key, let me undo that. 
You can hold down the Option key and triple click, one, two, three, and the dialog will open. So technically, it's the same thing as if you double click and then double click again. So it's an interpretation if you think it's a triple click or a dual double click. So it doesn't matter because if you want to delete all of them, just hold down the Option key and triple click and the dialog window will open. There is one variation, a little bit confusing. Option click on one of the automation points to select a segment. You could also only delete that segment, but for that you have to double click on, not on the first automation point, you have to double click on the second automation point. In that case, the same dialog window pops up and if you click delete, then only that segment of the automation curve will be deleted. So many different options. So you choose which one you want to incorporate into your workflow and then stick to that one. And about the trim and value automation curve uh, field right here, again, if you just click on it, you toggle all selected or all selected off, but it's also very handy if you want to trim the automation curve up and down. And remember we had the final resolution adjustment already in a previous section. If you control drag a value that you have a finer resolution. Here's how it works again. So you click hold down on an automation point and instead of going up and down, you hold down the control key and now we have a finer resolution. That means the cursor moves way farther apart before you make small adjustments. And one bonus click, let's switch here to the uh, mixer window. You can see you have the different automation modes. If you want to set them all to a specific automation mode, you just hold down the option key and select, for example, touch or option select latch or switch all of them back to read mm. just by holding down the option key. Without the option key, you just select individual channel strips. Okay, that sums it up about the hidden mouse click actions in Logic Pro 10. Hope you found this information useful and can incorporate that into your workflow. Also, check out my two books, Logic Pro 10 Tips, Tricks, Secrets, Part 1 and Part 2, with more tips, tricks, secrets, with information you might not find anywhere else. Don't forget to read my free Logic and Pro Tools tutorials and check out the books in my Graphically Enhanced Manual series. By the way, on Apple's iBook Store, you can download free samples of all my books in the special interactive multi-touch iBooks version, the best way to learn a software application. All the links are available on my website, dingdingmusic.com.